guys, Sarah here. Uh, happy holidays to anyone who is celebrating holiday right now. Uh, for my fiance and I, it's more of like a winter solstice sort of celebration, but I know people who are celebrating Christmas and Yule and Hanukkah and all these other things. So, um, Happy holidays for whatever holiday you might be celebrating right now. Um, I told you guys that I would be putting out a video before the holidays and technically it's uh, Christmas Eve so I am putting out a video before the holiday actually hits. Um, and then I thought that I would just do a quick Q&A for you guys. Pull some, some questions that have either been on Facebook or on YouTube and just answer them for you. Uh, so I'm going to jump right into it. Uh, Sid asked if I had ever heard of a melanistic corn snake. Uh, so for those of you who may not understand really what melanism or um, melanistic means, I did do a video on hypomelanism that I'll link up above in a card if you guys want to go watch that. Um, melanin is the pigment in the skin that is makes the darker colors. So uh, humans don't really have too many pigments in the skin. I think melanin might actually be, um, it's one of the few and the most prominent one and that's what makes our skin darker or lighter based on um, where you're ethnically from or even if you've been sitting out in the sun for a little bit too long and your skin gets darker when you get a tan, it's melanin. Uh, and so snakes, uh, at least corn snakes, uh, the dark coloring is melanin that you see. And a melanistic corn snake, I believe that what Sid kind of is meaning is a hyper melanistic corn snake instead of like a hypo melanistic corn snake, uh, where hypo melanism is a slight reduction in melanin. Um, hyper melanistic would be uh, additional melanin. And there really isn't a gene that is hyper melanistic in corn snakes. The closest thing that you're going to find really is the chocolate gene in the embryo. Uh, which is the Great Plains rat snake. And they're very, very closely related to corn snakes, but they do have some of their own gene mutations. Uh, if my fingers look weirdly yellow, it's because I've been baking today and I have like dyes and stuff on my hand from baking. Uh, so that's what that is, if anybody was wondering. Um, so the chocolate gene, I imagine, will eventually kind of leak into corn snakes. Uh, that tends to happen if there's a snake that's really closely related to corn snakes and then there's a lot of interbreeding going on. We already have creamsicles and uh, a few different genes that are kind of coming over uh, into corn snakes. Obviously, there's the scaleless, which originated with a cross between the emrei and the corn snakes. So there's a lot of hybrids already between emrei and corn snakes in the hobby. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if this chocolate gene did eventually kind of migrate over. Um, but I think that hypermelanism in corn snakes can happen by itself. If you see a lot of snakes that are wild caught, they often have a very dark sort of melanin wash over them. I've talked about this before, I think, in my like classic corn snake video. Uh, I'll put it in a card above also if you guys want to go watch that. Uh, the dark wash is just sort of, it, it is like a dark melanin wash over the rest of the coloration, and that's just to help the snake sort of hide a little bit better in the wild. Um, and so those you know, you could take that and breed to accentu accentuate that instead of breed to take it away. What we've done in the hobby for the most part is breed to take that melanin wash out because people really like the really bright colorations on corn snakes. And when you have that melanin wash, it's not very bright. So I imagine there's um, maybe three different possible ways of us getting hypermelanism in corn snakes. One, of course, being the chocolate being bred from the emrei into corn snakes. One being the accentuation of the natural melanin wash that happens over selective breeding, or the last one possibly being a new gene mutation that will just pop up in corn snakes somewhere. It happens all the time. I don't want to say it happens all the time, but obviously we have all of these gene mutations like amelanism and all these hypomelanistic genes and scaleless. Well, scaleless is a bad example, but stripe and all these other genes that just you know, gene mutations that just popped up naturally in corn snakes. And some of them were a little less natural than others, but, you know, um, we have them because they did occur randomly at some point. So hypermelanism, I think, is something that could very easily occur at some point. The next question is from Michael. These last two questions have both been on YouTube, by the way. Michael asks, uh, this is referring to my uh, Red Factor video, I believe, so I'll link it also if you guys want to go see that. He said, I thought that some red factors and red coat were found in the blood red line and was one of the things that was found during the outcrossing. Um, 
This is kind of a weird thing. If you do watch that video, you'll kind of understand that Red Factor and Red Coat is very, uh, it's a very difficult thing to really pinpoint. And sometimes it's hard to tell them apart. But uh, from what I can tell, the original Red Coats actually originated from Okatee lines, specifically the Okatee lines that uh, Lava came from. So Lava originated in Okatee. Um, especially the land race lavas specifically. I believe that Joe Pierce was the one who actually found this gene. Um, and with, within that same line, the red coat gene also came. Now, red coat may have also come from blood red lines. Uh, it could be that there's multiple different strains of red coat, and that's why it's really been hard to sort of like pit, like nail down as a gene for so long. Uh, it is possible that there's uh, multiple different red enhancing genes, red coat just being one of them. Or maybe there's multiple different types of red coat, just like there's multiple different types of hypo. We don't really know that for sure, but I do know that at least one strain of red coat did come out of the lava, the original lava genes gene that came out of um, Okatees. So uh, it's kind of more official in my mind, or at least this is like you know, I my I pride myself on understanding the history of the genes, and that's that was sort of um, one of the ones that was really difficult to research because, again, not a whole lot of people work with red coat or have really figured out exactly where it came from. But from what I can tell, the oldest known history of red coat was from these Okatees that uh, produce lava, and from like within that lava gene or that lava line also came what we know today is red coat. So there's your answer for the red coat. For the red factor, it is possible that some red factor gene came out of blood red, but I actually believe that what was causing the original blood reds to appear so red was the natural melanin wash that I talked about earlier. Um, the original blood reds were very, very dark, dark red, but I don't believe that it was necessarily because of a red enhancing mutation. I believe that it was actually because of this melanin wash, and there may have even been a little bit of an, an extra natural red wash as well that has kind of been bred out over time. Uh, but the original red factor that we know of as just red factor or coral now uh, was actually believed to have uh, originated in Don Soderbergh's uh, um, Sun Glow lines. And uh, he there's there's a few different strains of red factor. Uh, red factor is definitely a, a very different and interesting topic to discuss. Uh, and I, I've already done a few different videos on like coral versus, um, you know, red factor versus, uh, you know, strawberry and red coat. Like it's a very complicated um, mess of things that we're still kind of trying to sort out. But the cor the red coat, or I'm sorry, the red factor that we know of that recreates like the coral lines originated in Don Soderbergh's Sun Glows. And then there's also another red factor mutation called Cherry, which is co completely different and is completely separate. Uh, it's also believed that some of the original Champagne corns maybe had their own red factor type of mutation. I'm not going to go into the champagnes and stuff right now. It's even more complex to talk about that. I believe that I did a video on um, on like all of the coral stuff, so I'll, I'll also try to link it above. I know I'm linking a lot of things for you guys to go reference, but um, it's not something that I want to go into huge detail here, especially since I've already gone into like really in-depth detail before on it. Uh, we're almost at like nine minutes anyway in this video, and I just kind of wanted to move this, uh, move through this a little bit quicker. Uh, so anonymous, uh, someone who wanted to remain anonymous on Facebook asked me, uh, what are my thoughts on getting snakes as pets for the holidays? Um, this is a very interesting topic. And again, I'm going to try to kind of make it short. Obviously, people who are selling anything really enjoy the holidays because of the money that's coming in. But uh, I do want to say to anyone out there who is getting someone a snake for the holidays, if you are getting it for someone who already owns snakes and they're an adult or maybe even almost an adult, like between 15 and 17 years old, uh, they already have snakes, they're used to snakes, you know that this is a snake that they want, and you already know that they can take care of it, or or they've proven that they can take care of it on their own. Have at it. If you know that it's something that they want and that they're going to take care of, then that's that's all that matters to me as, as someone who is, like, selling these animals. Um, but if you are, you know, maybe a parent who is getting a snake 
for a very young child and it's the child's first snake and you've never owned a snake before and stuff like that. Um, I, I always say you're never really, you're never too young to experience reptiles. But what I will say is you can be too young to take care of reptiles. So as the adult, as the parent of this child, it is definitely important that you understand that you are going to be the one taking care of the snake uh, at some point, most likely. It is highly unlikely that a five-year-old or an eight-year-old or maybe even a ten-year-old um, is going to like maintain interest in that snake for the rest of the snake's life or even the rest of, you know, obviously not the rest of the kid's life, but it is just important to remember that anytime that you buy any kind of pet for your child who is under you know, like I said, late teenage age, um, there's a good chance they're going to lose interest in it. And there's a good chance that you as the parent will end up taking care of that animal. So whether it's a snake or a guinea pig or a rabbit or a cat or dog or anything else that you would buy for your kids, all I can say is just like, remember that you will probably be the one taking care of it. That's all there is to it. Um, if you are the only adult in the household and and you are putting this responsibility on a six-year-old or an eight-year-old or even maybe a 10 or 12-year-old, uh, there is a chance that they are just going to stop taking care of that animal, especially if they're really young. Um, and I know that there's a lot of parents who 100% understand that anyway. And I, again, I'm not opposed to people obviously getting their kids pets for Christmas or for birthdays or whatever. But uh, again, make sure that it's something that you as the adult are okay with taking care of. You are buying a pet for your kid, but you're actually buying a pet for yourself. So if you, if you are afraid of snakes and you don't like snakes and you're never gonna touch the snake, but you know, your six-year-old wanted a snake, I would say maybe this is not the best time to buy your kid the pet that they want. Um, maybe wait until your kid is a little older to get them a pet, a little more responsible to get them a pet, and maybe wait and see if they want a pet that you are okay with taking care of. If they are okay with lizards instead, and you're okay with lizards instead, uh, then maybe a lizard would be a better pet than a snake. Snakes are really cool, obviously I love them, um, but if you are an adult buying a gift for a child, assuming it's your own child especially, it just needs to be something that you will be okay taking care of. I know that I've droned on about this for a few minutes now, but I just kind of wanted to emphasize that. If you're buying it for an adult who you know that wants it, I'm 100% fine with it. If you're buying it for an older, an older child, so like I want to say teenage years child, and you know that they are going to take care of it, okay. Still remember that ultimately that's going to be your responsibility if the animal dies. You are the adult in this, in this situation. Um, but if it's a, a kid who's like under maybe 12 years old, uh, and it's a pet that you refuse to touch or refuse to interact with, uh, maybe maybe try a different pet or maybe you don't get the kid a pet this year, maybe a different year. Or, you know, like I said, maybe try a pet that you are okay with that's also relatively low maintenance. There are a lot of lizards that are relatively low maintenance, so if your kid wants a reptile, you can start with a lizard instead, something like that. Um, it was a question that was asked, and there's a reason it was asked anonymously. A lot of people don't really want to take the heat for saying, hey, parents, when you're buying a pet for your kid, you're actually buying a pet for yourself. Uh, and I just don't mind the heat, so, you know, bring it on. I, it's winter right now, and I really prefer the summer, so bring on the heat. Uh, the very last question that I'm going to answer is from Frankie, and Frankie asks, would you ever get into ball pythons? And the answer to that would be no, I'm sorry. I'm not a huge fan of ball pythons, but I did just get a pair of spotted pythons that will be able to breed in like three to five years, so I'm very excited about those. If you don't know anything about spotted pythons, I will probably make a video on them in the future, especially since I really, really enjoy them. That's going to be it for this video, guys. We're almost at 15 minutes. Thank you for being here. Subscribe if you haven't. I do corn snake videos relatively, oh, well, I only do corn snake videos, and I'm going to try to start doing them weekly again once 2021 comes. I hope that we live until 2021. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you in the next video.